You are listening to the Angry March Podcast Network. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Emerson Whitner, and this is not your NXT audio update. Actually, it's something completely different. NXT is going to be uh, showing nothing but best of shows the next two weeks. So I've got an hour of my life free, and instead of doing something else with my life, I uh, pulled out my Memphis Wrestling DVDs from 1988. So this week and next week, I'm going to take us back to January 1988 and review an episode of Memphis Wrestling. Uh, the first show we're reviewing today, January 16th. I want to point out this will not be a weekly segment or a weekly show. Um, unless I really, really get into this show and really, really want to give up something else. Um, but we'll see how things go. But uh, let's kick things off here. January 16th, 1988. Lance Russell and Dave Brown welcomed us to a new, exciting edition of CWA. Announced that the main event was an expiration of time match with Big Scott Hall and Billy Travis versus the Power Twins. I got excited over what an expiration of time match would be until I found out what it was. Um, We also found out that next week is the first Renegade Rampage match, uh, which is a tournament that will be running over the next few months, sponsored by Renegade, which I believe was a cigarette company. Uh, The winner of the tournament gets $250,000. I wonder if Jerry Lawler's fake bank account can hold that much fake money. So with that, we go to our first match of the night, Manny Fernandez versus Rodney Knapper. Fernandez came out to La Bamba. Uh, This is the same Manny Fernandez, by the way, who once had a sombrero on a pole match in Mid-Atlantic in 1985. So him coming out to La Bamba is the least racist thing he's done so far. In fact, isn't even the most racist thing on this show. Uh, Last week, they said that Manny was wrestling Billy Travis when that damn Hector Guerrero interfered and hit Travis with a chain. However, Manny saw this and did not approve of these shenanigans, uh, showing that he's really a good guy and all this. Napper appeared to weigh approximately 120 pounds, and Manny completely no-sold all attempted offense by Napper. Um, Manny then won with a flying crossbody, which looked more like a flying forearm. We then began the Jimmy Jack Funk segment of the show, which lasted for about half of the show. Unreal, Jimmy Jack Funk, one of the smaller people in the WWF in 1986, was quite large compared to everyone on this show. Um, This was his first interview. He came out yelling about how kids look up to sissies like Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee. Um, And he talked about how he and his partner T. Joe Kahn are not sissies. And that they were coming to take out uh, sissies like Jerry Lawler. This led us to our next match with Jimmy Jack Funk and T. Joe Kahn versus the Wilson brothers, Benny and David. Um, It doesn't matter who they are, to be fair, because they got attacked right from the bell and never even had a chance to get into the bout. Uh, Funk and Khan just beat them and beat them and beat them, um, and eventually Khan pinned Benny with a running chop to the throat. Hell of a finisher, if I do say so myself. Jimmy Jack picked up the cowbell, but then dropped it for some reason so he could just give one of the Wilsons a double sledge. And on the way out, they stopped by Lance and Dave, to scream that they are not, in fact, sissies. Good to know, I guess. I want to take time out to point out that this Wednesday night at the Evansville Coliseum, we have some big matches, including Bill Dundee versus the world television champion Terry Taylor this Wednesday night at the Evansville Coliseum. Um... And including also a special tag team match player when Jimmy Jack Funk and T. Joe uh, take on Manny Fernandez and Jeff Jarrett. Jimmy Jack came in and was mad that Manny is now a sissy lover. We went to commercial, come back from the commercial, 
where Jeff Jarrett's shiny blue shirt cut a promo. This man had style in 1988. Um, Couldn't cut a promo to save his life, but he had style. He said he had a lot of tough, memorable matches in 87, and has already had matches in 88 with Hector Guerrero. Uh, Hector Guerrero wants people to feel bad for him, but Jeff, Jeff doesn't feel bad for Hector Guerrero. You know who I feel bad for? Jeff Jarrett, because then they showed a commercial for the Jeff Jarrett poster that they're selling at the concession stand and that you can uh, purchase. You can call and purchase or mail in a check or money order for $10 an order. Um, Imagine Jeff Jarrett as a sex symbol. Yes, Jeff Jarrett is a sex symbol in 1988. He was shirtless. He's wearing ripped jeans. It looked like they just hosed him down, and he's just standing there, and they uh, printed up a poster with him on it while the female voiceover lady talked about how sexy he was. I want to point out, he actually looked a lot like Dolph Ziggler, of all people. So now if you're wondering what Dolph's going to look like in 20 years... Just look at Jeff Jarrett. This led to Jimmy Jack Funk coming out for the continuation of the Jimmy Jack Funk Hour. Uh, the call Jeff Jarrett a sissy. He said Jeff should be on should be the poster child for birth control, and Jarrett responded by calling him the first abortion that still lived. Jimmy Jack challenged him to a match, while Jeff said that he never backs down from a challenge. However, he has a match with Keith Harris. So Jeff turned around to go wrestle Keith Harris when Jimmy Jack attacked from behind. Jimmy Jack hit him with a chair and threw him into the ring. Jarrett made a comeback, which is when a referee ran into the ring, rang the bell, and we got ourselves a match between Jeff Jarrett and Jimmy Jack Funk, and sadly, Keith Harris did not get to wrestle. Jarrett was getting the upper hand when T. Joe Kahn ran in for disqualification, After a brief two-on-one beatdown, to the shock of no one, Manny Fernandez made the save um, to save Jeff Jarrett from this horrible two-on-one beatdown at the hands of Jimmy Jack Funk and T.J. Khan. Manny Fernandez, there's a lot of things you could say about the man, but the one thing you cannot say is he cut a coherent promo. I think he was trying to be the Hispanic version of Dusty Rhodes. I'm talking about he was going to do things on his own. However, he mumbled and he talked way too fast and you couldn't understand a dang thing he was saying. Um, It sounded like he said at one point he vowed to be patriotism and he is sick and tired of cowards and dared Jimmy Jack Funk to attack him. Jimmy Jack came up after Manny left and yelled that Manny has become a sissy. I want to point out that Jimmy Jack has broken the world's record in saying sissy the most number of times in the first 20 minutes of a TV show. <clears throat> this Wednesday in Evansville, Indiana, coming to the Coliseum, the Rockers to put the Southern Tag Team titles on the line against Big Scott Hall and Ken Wayne, and there's not going to just be one referee. There are going to be two referees this Wednesday night in Evansville. Also, since the last commercial break 10 minutes earlier, Terry Taylor has lost the World Television Championship, as he was referred to as the former World Television Champion. So at some point in the last 10 minutes, he lost the belt. But he's still wrestling Bill Dundee this Wednesday night in Evansville. Uh, Speaking of Bill, uh, we had an angle up next. Jerry Lawler came out for a promo. He said that he's still the Lord of the Ring. In fact, he has a ring signifying he's the Lord of the Ring and that he recently defended it against Bill Dundee. Bill Dundee had put up $5,000, and that Jerry had still won. He started talking about Bill, saying he doesn't care how popular Bill is. Uh, All wrestling is is uh, is about winning, and both men want to win over the other man no matter what. He pointed out again that Bill put up a $5,000 check against the ring. Jerry won, but when he went to cash the check, Bill issued a stop payment on the check, so Jerry didn't get his money. So out came Bill Dundee in his dapper suit. Bill said the referee was knocked out and he had a 78 count on Jerry, 
but it was unfair that the referee was out. Jerry pointed out that these are the breaks, plus Bill used the chain on him. Uh, Lawler also asked him how it felt to know that he needed to bring a chain to the ring to beat Jerry. He sat back in that locker room before the match last week, and he knew that he was unable to beat Jerry Lawler cleanly, so he had to bring a chain with him to the ring. Jerry said that Bill uh, wasn't a man whose word was worth anything. Uh, Bill pointed out that he was made to take the $5,000 out in cash for a future match where they're going to have the same stips, but instead of a check, it's going to be Bill's $5,000 cash. Uh, Bill accused him of paying off the referee, which is what led to uh, everything breaking down. The, the two began shoving each other until suddenly two scrawny dudes from the back came out and pointed Bill to the dressing room, and Bill decided to fight another day. The Rockers came out for a promo. Marty Janetti tells Lance Russell to get the flock out of here. Uh, Marty's promo was talking about how everyone in the North loved him, and that nothing's going to stop them one day from becoming AWA World Tag Team Champions. Uh, Shawn Michaels pointed out that they were supposed to wrestle the Nasty Boys, but the Nasty Boys ran away to another territory. They're not afraid of Big Scott Hall or a midget named Ken Wayne. And there's two referees this week, and they're going to see, and both referees are going to watch them kick the butts of Scott Hall and Ken Wayne. Uh, they want to wipe the slate clean. He said the CWA keeps searching for teams to beat them, which is impossible, but they just want one team that are going to make them sweat. They also turned their attention to Jeff Jarrett and Jerry Lawler, saying that today they're going to consider their opponents Lawler and Jarrett, which led to the next, the longest match of the day, the Midnight Rockers versus Rick Fontana and Todd Morton. Uh, Lance Russell wasn't sure if Todd was related to Ricky Morton, but he was pretty sure he was. Uh, Sean and Marty, uh, this is a very lackadaisical match for them. Uh, in fact, it was actually a handicap match because Todd Morton never tagged in. Uh, they beat on Rick Fontana for four and a half minutes. They pulled Rick Fontana's singlet strap down to pretend that he was Jerry Lawler uh, as they continued to beat on the man. And uh, eventually, they pinned Fontana with a double DDT. Jeff Jarrett's sweater then cut a promo for this Wednesday night in Evansville. He's very happy to be Manny Fernandez's partner. And then Manny walked in and did another gibberish-filled promo. And then it was time for the main event. The expiration of time match. The Power Twins in their debut with Nate the Great in their corner versus Billy Travis and Todd Morton. Yes, the same Todd Morton from the last match who never tagged in. I guess uh, Scott Hall didn't show up. I think there was a snowstorm um, or something because they did mention uh, that uh, they tried to get as many people to the studio as possible for this show. But either way, we had our match here uh, with the Power Twins versus Billy Travis and Todd Morton. Morton, or if not, never even bothered to leave the ring, so he got assigned to this match too. Um, the Power Twins were not very good, and they were also not the best of partners despite being twin brothers as the biggest spot of the match was them running into each other, which literally set up nothing. Not the finish, not a hot spot from the baby faces, nothing. Travis had no problems beating up either man. The Power Twins were so bad that even when they did the twin switching gimmick, it sucked so bad that the referee even called the, them out on it and forced them out of the ring and the other one back in. We then got the bell. The three and a half minute time limit expired. I am completely serious. This match had a three and a half minute time limit, which is what the expiration of time match was because they only had three and a half minutes of TV time remaining. Um, well, they had a little more than three and a half minutes. We'll get into that in a minute here. But uh, they only had three and a half minutes for this last match, and they went the time limit. So the grueling three-and-a-half-minute time limit did elapse. Todd Morton being a total Iron Man here 
uh, going almost nine minutes tonight or today. The Midnight Rockers closed the show by cutting another promo about Jeff Jarrett and Jerry Lawler, who I would like to point out they are not wrestling next week in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, They cut a promo on the fans of the CWA, and this is where things got a little racist. They specifically called out the people in the balcony who were so poor they were up there in the balcony eating fried chicken and watermelon. They also said that they will not wrestle until they double ticket prices and get better police security at the matches. And then they walked away begging for more competition. Uh, The show wrapped up with Lance and Dave at the table uh, telling you everything you saw in case you missed it, which is a nice touch. And they even had closing credits, complete with a voiceover guy saying that the announcers were not affiliated with the station that you're watching and were hired by Championship Wrestling of America. So that was CWA. That was Memphis Wrestling from uh, January of 1988. Really fun show. Uh, Next week, the Renegade Rampage Tournament begins, and we'll see what happens from there. But until then, thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you again in seven days. You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network.